say it's under 100 degrees. Yay! It's not snowing. It's just a nice day. It's so nice. Um, hope you guys are well. Um, something I was just going to say. I got thinking about the weather. Um, what are we going to do? We're going to do announcements. Uh, the uh, get off your can tomorrow morning. Well, wait a minute, 10 o'clock tomorrow, we'll get the funeral or whatever. I'm, I'm still happy. Barry's coming to the funeral, but I'm still happy. Okay, get off your can. We'll be here at 10 o'clock for exercise, but Sydney Witt's funeral will be tomorrow at 11 down at Oak. No, we don't have lots. At lots. I've worked with Oakies more than I've worked with lots. Um, and uh, the viewing will be this afternoon, 2 to 4, 6 to 8. And well, let me just read this right here while, I'm, while we're doing this. Uh, Sydney's family would like to express to the congregation on behalf of Sydney the gracious appreciation and support for the love received from his church. He always looked forward to attending church on Sunday and fellowship with his church family. After losing Connie, his wife, the church became even more important, giving him a sense of connection. We, the family, will be forever grateful. And uh, that is an expression from his family to you guys. And he really, he really did uh, think, think, uh, think very much of you all. I've spent a good deal of time with Sydney in the past two or three weeks. Uh, he was in the hospital just a lot, uh, in, in, in the hospital, and died suddenly. We weren't expecting that. Uh, he was looking really bad, and then the next day he was looking great, and then two days later that was it, just real quick. Uh, but he got tremendous care uh, all the way through, and uh, he did real well. So I'm sure they would appreciate any uh, expressions uh, of, of concern. I know he's a, a big part of this place. Uh, any other uh, blood draft? Blood draft tomorrow uh, after the funeral, uh, one to seven. So if you need to, uh, you know, it's good to get blood. Sometimes our blood gets too thick, and it, it's good to thin it out every now and then. And then you create new blood. You make new stuff, and uh, that, that's uh, it's a good thing to do. And they they, they need it right now. Uh, youth Bible study. The over 55 breakfast group will meet on August 11 at 9 o'clock, and the CWF is meeting uh, this week? No. Next not, week? Not in August. Not meeting in August? No. Okay. Okay, not meeting in August. Any other announcements that we want to share with you? I have one. Yes. <laughs> so, Crop Walk. We're thinking about Crop Walk. October 10th is the walk, and they're going to do both the regular crop walk from the church, the Presbyterian Church in Rome, and they're going to do the walk where you can walk on your own whenever you can that whole week. So, like we did last year during the pandemic, so both, you can do either. They are also this year having a pack to park on September 19th at Salem Red Sox. They're going to have a concert at 3, and then the game starts at 4 and 5. The tickets for this are discounted at $10, and all of that goes to the club. So, if you're interested, see me. Um, we are looking at starting children's worship up again. Um, right now, the plan is to start at September, first weekend in September. We're going to have a sign-up sheet, and the um, entryway, which is not there yet, we're going to hopefully by next week, I'll have that up, so we can have people signed up to... Um, be going to do children's moment, so at least that's the, team, the plan at this time, so we can hopefully get that started up again. Uh, I'd also like to say that last week, uh, Get Off the Can took 70 pounds of food to the food pantry. Oh. Thank you everyone for your support. That's a really, it's a really, really, really good deal. Wait, I'm getting a famous one about it. Uh, yes, August the 29th, we will be having our picnic, uh, or whatever we're calling it. We will be here at uh, this facility, and I hope we'll sell the schools, the market calendar. I think it's Sunday, August.
to find out some jokes in the joke desk. Okay, these jokes have not been vetted. <laughs> this one or this one? It's not my fault, guys. He did it. Okay. 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 My 11 year old takes his homework seriously. One question required him to write a sentence using the word version. His sentence Have you heard the Virgin Mary? <laughs> Have you heard of the Virgin Mary? I'm going to read this one too. <laughs> a trooper pulls over a priest and immediately smells alcohol on his breath. The next thing he notices is an empty wine bottle lying on the passenger seat. Have you been drinking, the officer says. Just water, says the priest. Then why do I smell wine? Priest looks at the bottle and shouts, Good Lord, he's done it again. <laughs> All right, so the disciple minister's meeting with the, with the Methodist minister and the Baptist minister. And they get talking about the problem, but the church of one says, Oh, we have terrible cockroaches in our kitchen. He says, What did you do? He says, Well, we just have to call Terminex all the time. Methodist minister says, Well, we used to have mice. The disciple says, we got raccoons, man. We got raccoons breaking in the church all the time. He says, we can't get rid of the raccoons. How do you get rid of your mice? He says, oh, it's really just simple. You just catch them, baptize them, and you only see them on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we will vote later to see which one of those you like the best. Shall we have a prayer as we dim the lights and begin our service? Our Father God, we thank you for our ability to, to grieve and to, to mourn with families that have lost. We, we thank you for our ability to laugh, for we know that for everything there is a, a season, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to laugh and a time to grieve, a, a time to dance and a time to shout. We pray you be with us in our time of worship this morning and draw near, for indeed you are our God and we are your people. Be with us in the power of his Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Sidney Whip. He was in the hospital at Lewis Gale. And so I knocked on the door. Back in those days, it was, we were under pretty strict protocol, so I had my mask on. And so I stepped in, and he was sitting in a, in a chair, and his daughter was over there. And I said, Mr. Whip, I'm the preacher. And I walked over and kind of took my mask off. I knew he'd be look, been looking on the on the TV screen, and as I walked over, he looked at me and he says, God is good. And I thought, yep, yep, you read about that, 
God is good. I'm, I'm not sure what that was, but in Psalm 100, I kind of put those two things together. You know, Sidney left us pretty quick. And this is kind of a psalm that fits right into Sidney's attitude of God is good, particularly the last line. So when I think of Psalm 100 from now on, I kind of think of Sidney. Listen to this. Listen to this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. How can you possibly write anything better than that? As we think about the goodness of the Lord and the passing of his word from generation to generation, shall we stand together for our hymn of praise? Like for God, it's always a good day, you know. 
we, we welcome down here when we deal with human weather, it's different. But joyful, joyful is always going on in heaven. Angels are flying around praising God all the time. No matter what's happening down here, God's always there. Uh, joys and concerns. What kind of joy? We got some good joys. We got some good joys. We found out this week we will be great grandparents. <laughs> God has blessed people with the wisdom to be able to make these things happen. 
all through the years that people don't realize all that we have, all our resources, they all came from God. God gave people wisdom to be able to figure out how to do this. Um, and I have a couple of concerns. One prayer is for all the people that are dealing with and have had to evacuate from all the fires. And I have a daughter that lives in Louisiana that now has COVID. And she has COVID issues. But it's a blessing at this time that she is out of the hospital. She is at where she is. It's her house. Um, but COVID is a death and the people, the families that are trying to work through it and do it. I have a let's see. Um, Charles Russell, the father of a co of mine, has been in the hospital for quite some time. Um, I'm not sure if he's still in it right now, but he has been in the hospital, so he's going to be with uh, health issues. Our deepest sympathy to the family of Sidney Witt, who passed away late Tuesday night at Lewisville. Uh, we want to have our, our thoughts and prayers to to be with them. There was a, a minister retired at National City Christian Church, our, our church in Washington. <coughs> so they hired another great minister to come in. And he was there a couple of months and he resigned and left and went back where he used to be. The, the guy, the, the first minister that was up there was named uh, Howard Howard Howell. And they said, why are you leaving? He said, Howard Howell's DNA is in the walls of this place. He says, you can't do or say anything without dealing with Howard. He says, I love Howard to death, but I'm just tired of dealing with him. So he went on. And some people in a church are just kind of part of the DNA. Uh, and and uh, it's, uh, you, kind of, you kind of grieve your way into acceptance, and you just kind of blend that into your your life together as you move forward. But uh, yeah, we, we certainly appreciate everything that Sydney's done for Salem, uh, for the church, his family. Uh, shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Our Father God, as we come to you in prayer this morning, we are conscious that your Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, receives our prayers and lifts them up in your direction, that Jesus Christ himself is our great high priest. He intercedes for us beyond our own groaning and moaning and longing. We pray this morning for the blessing of your healing touch, that comfort and peace may come to Sydney's family, that in their great faith, which he has helped to pass on, that they know that he is in your hands, that Jesus has embraced him with his loving arms, and that he is in his home, his room that Jesus has prepared, not made with human hands. That Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and those that believe in him shall never die. We're thankful for the power of his resurrection that is offered to each of us, that lifts us from this world to the place that you have prepared for our future. We're thankful for your son that broke the bonds of death itself and offers those who follow him the life which is eternal. We pray this morning for those who are facing the, the, the ugliness, the pain, the suffering of the virus which has gripped the world. In our lifetimes, we've never seen a pandemic like this, and we pray that it goes away. We, we pray for those who are living with folks who have it, family members who are dying, who are sick, the separation and the loss of young ones. In this evil and terrible experience, we, we ask your blessing, for indeed you can bring peace and hope and even joy in the midst of terrible circumstances. Be with those who are facing the fires of this time. There are so many difficulties and situations which must be dealt with and overcome. Cause us to remember that you are God and to take moments to be still and to focus our thoughts and our prayers on your healing and your power and your guidance. Guide us 
and lead us, we pray, through these times, and hear us as we lift the prayer that even your Son Jesus taught each of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Please receive communion in his name here at Fort Lewis Christian Churches as we begin to remember who the Messiah is and what he means to us individually. Shall we turn to our communion hymn and listen to the words as you sing this song? It is a beautiful hymn. Really show up. It's 
something happens out of nowhere and it solves the problem. Manna from heaven. You know, the body of Christ is actually manna from heaven. Come down from heaven. He comes to earth to go upon the cross to offer us the loaf, which is manna from heaven. In this wilderness of human life, where we're so often lost, and on our best days, we don't know what God's doing with us. We don't know what God's going to do tomorrow. We don't know what's coming. We're always in the wilderness. But yet he gives us this manna from heaven, the very body of his son, Jesus Christ. Because when we are in the presence of Christ, we're okay. We're, we're feeding on his spiritual manna because we're in the wilderness almost all the time. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe and affirm that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, please receive communion in his name. If you will take the chalice cup that you have and peel back the loaf and get to the manna part, It doesn't take a whole lot of manna to save one's spiritual life. The body of Christ, a new, a new covenant, a new covenant with God, agreement, forgiveness of our sins through the body and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, shall we pray. Our Father God, receive our prayers. We pray for forgiveness in his name. We pray for salvation in his name. We pray for this manna that delivers us from the wilderness even as the Hebrew people were delivered. We pray your blessing that it might be to us eternal life in his name. Amen. Jesus said, do this in memory of me. And if you will open the cup. Some people call this the blood of life. The blood that flowed through King David and Abraham, the blood that flowed through Solomon and Jesus, the royal line of God. In this little cup, he said, this is a new covenant. This is, a, this is your agreement with God for eternal life through the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus says, do this in memory of me. Shall we pray? Our Father God, we pray that you will enforce indeed this covenant, that you would make us to be your people, free and clear of sin, that you will remove sin from us as far as the east is from the west, and you will choose to throw our sin into the lake of forgetfulness because of the great sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray, our Father, that you would bind us into thyself in these special Holy moments, we pray. Amen. Even as we let the, the manna from heaven sink in, shall we pay close attention to the words of this hymn?
you know, well, he did it again. Every time you look up, that apostle Paul is getting thrown in jail. He, uh, you know, sometimes there was a there was a young woman that was prophesying. He took the demon out of her. Her owner was making a lot of money on her prophecy. He got really angry. It, it crippled his livelihood. He was uh, Paul was preaching Jesus, the King of the world, and there was this statue of Caesar right there. And the Romans got really mad about that. There's a bunch of Jews who said they would not eat again until they had killed him. So they had to lower him out of the wall in a basket so that he could escape town. He was beaten several times with rods and shipwrecked. And every time you look up, he's in jail again. He's been a troublemaker. Now, the part about this, he didn't have any of that trouble until he met Jesus. He was going on about his business. He was one of the best scholars in Jerusalem. The family had money. He was on top of the world. He worked with the best teachers. And so Jesus reveals himself to Paul, and now Paul's getting out of prison all the time. It's, it, it's like he's going to foreign places, begging food. Uh, he says, I have suffered all things. I have suffered all things. So anyway, he's in prison, probably in Rome, maybe Ephesus, we're not sure, but probably Rome. And he's not feeling pretty good because it may end up with his head getting chopped off. And so you're in the Roman prison, which are not noted for their comfort. I've been in some bad motels in my life, but uh, never a Roman prison, which are often underground. Uh, it, it, it's like they will dig out and, uh, they will dig out a pit and put a fence over top of it. I mean, it's not like you're in a cozy cell with you know cable TV and exercise privileges and really good food like these days. This is a pretty rough place to be. And Paul's friends at a church in a place called Philippi, he had some really good friends there, they hear about it, and so they send him a gift. And one of the one of the deacons in the church of Philippi brings this gift to Rome and gives it to Paul. And you can imagine, I think, how that must have revived his spirits. Here he is by himself in this dungeon for a while, and then this guy shows up with these gifts from the church of Philippi. And they're talking theology, and the guy that comes in tells Paul, you know, everything that's going on at the church, you know, says, Paul, you know, your preaching started all of this, and that program you started here, and the education program's doing so good, and you've had 10 new members, and giving's up, and the church is doing great. So here's Paul, it's like, man, that's, I, I mean, to a preacher, that's really good news. And Paul writes this letter, we call it Philippians, and he sends it through this messenger back to the church. And it's one of the warmest, you can imagine, you're, you're there and you're feeling terrible and this guy shows up with gifts from the church. And so Paul writes down how he's feeling, what he's thinking. It's kind of a heart to heart. It's the warmest. It's the warmest, most personal letter that we have from the Apostle Paul about life and death and theology and church. And if you get to the third chapter, it wasn't written in chapters and verses. It's just a letter that he wrote. And, and, and he says this. He says, whatever gains I have had, I consider loss for Christ's sake. He says, I've had times when I had everything. And I've had times when I didn't have much. But I consider all of that rubbish, except for one thing. There's just one thing I want. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, I know. I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Paul doesn't say he wants to go to heaven. He says, I want to know the power of Christ's resurrection. When I was young and crazy, the, uh, I grew up in North Virginia Beach area, and I was a lifeguard at Virginia Beach for several years. And so a couple of us decided that as the hurricane Hazel was coming in, that the waves would be really good. And so 
after everybody left the beach and they took down all those red danger signs, and we got our little surfboards and we went out. And believe me, when the hurricane's coming in off the Virginia coast, those waves, you, they lift you up so high, you can look down on the boardwalk at Virginia Beach. I mean, these are big waves. And you know, when you're 17, 18, you're pretty much bulletproof. <laughs> but, but we went a little bit too far over the crest of one of those waves. And believe me, there's power in those waves. When you hear them crashing, and, and all three of us were up, way up on the beach, kind of in shock, just kind of stretched out because that wave just slammed us down off the bottom and then it threw us up completely overcome by the power of those waves. And as we walked away, we said, we'll never do this again. <laughs> You know, you do crazy things. Like, you know, one of the three, one day we thought, you know, we're sitting there on the beach, so let's see how far we can swim. So we started swimming out to sea. And we swam, and we swam, and we swam, and then my buddy says, you know, I'm getting really tired. We better go back. I mean, you get the problem here? Now you got to turn around and swim back. You've gone as far as you can possibly, you got to the point of no return, and then you got to go back. And I remember looking at those two guys, and I thought, you know, I think I can make it back. And I can probably drag one of them, but I can't drag them, brother. And I, I, I thought, you know, this is the craziest thing we've ever done. But there are big things in life that you can't come back from. And Paul was in prison, and he may well have gotten his head cut off because of the situation at the time. And so he's writing to the church at Philippi, his friends, and he says, you know what, I mean, this is like heart to heart. You know, it's like you're talking to your good friend and, and you're telling them things that you normally would say. It's like, you know, I just want one thing out of everything in my life. I want to know the power of the resurrection of Christ. That somehow I might achieve resurrection from the dead. Now, you don't think about resurrection when you're buying a new car. You don't think about that when you're getting married. You don't think about resurrection when you're watching your faith. But when you're in jail, and they might very well cut your head off, and you've had this experience with the risen Christ anyway, and you know something about his power, and it becomes more real to you. It becomes more real to you. Just like the guy that went in and his doctor was telling him he had cancer. He said, you know, I never worried about a cancer treatment was really effective before, but now all of a sudden my life depended on it. The most important thing in the world to me was if that cancer treatment actually worked. Not on other people, but on me. Paul got to the point where it was just him. I mean, we're not talking about preaching to the multitudes. We're not talking about theological discussion. It was him and death. What I want at this point in my life is just to know the power of the resurrection of Christ. Not even worried about getting to heaven. The guy says to me, he says, you preachers are all the time talking about heaven. Trying to scare us into being good. I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about heaven. I said, I got no idea what's going to happen. I said, but I know what's going to happen to you and to me. They're going to put you in a box, they're going to dig a deep hole, they're going to put you down there, and they're going to cover it up and they're all going to walk away. How are you getting out of the box? He says, you trying to get around to heaven? I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. Said, How are you getting out of the box? If you don't know the power of the resurrection of Christ, what are you going to do for eternity? It's real simple. This, this is not a theory. This is not some kind of conjecture. It's coming. You know, you're going to graduate from high school. Oh, my God, i got to get a job. You're going to retire. I wish I'd put more money in my pension. You know? You're going to get married. I wish I'd checked out her disposition a little more before. before. <laughs> you know, there, there are things you look back on and you wish you checked them out better. You know, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ and you call upon him as your personal Savior and that faith relationship with God, 
and you're invited in to the situation where you share the power of his resurrection, you got a whole new deal. You got a whole new deal. And that two cents is still on that table. And you can't pay two cents for it. There is nothing you can do to earn it. Paul says, my whole life I followed the law, but that does not matter. It is in faith, in Christ, in God. You're given this. Wow. For God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus Christ that all who believe in him should be saved forever. No money in the contract. No labor in the contract. do not say you got to do this, you got to do that. All who believe in him shall be saved. I, I tell people, I say, you'll never get a better deal. They, they complain about preaching and going to church. I say, this is the best deal you'll ever get. Best deal you ever get. That's all they want is my money at church. Keep your money. Keep your money. You can't pay for it. There ain't no way you can pay for eternal life. How much money, how much is that worth? A gazillion, zillion dollars? Mm -hmm. How much would you pay for eternal life? You ain't got enough. Nobody's got enough. You know? Paul writes back to the Philippians and he says, you know, I was really down, but you guys have lifted my spirit. You, you, you sent my friend here. You, you, you've given me these gifts. You've told me about your great concern for me. And now I want to share this with you. I just want to share this with you. The most important thing in my great mind you know, Paul was a super brilliant religious thinker. He devoted his whole life, once he met Christ, that was it. The rest of his life in serving Jesus. But that didn't matter. He didn't, he didn't say, hey, I've been a Christian a long time, so I get to be the boss. Or, look at all the things I did. I'm much better than everybody else. No, 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 no. His only claim to fame was his faith in Jesus Christ. And all he wanted, after giving his hope, all he wanted was to know the power of Christ's resurrection. We used to have a thing in my family. We had four boys, and it wasn't a wealthy family. So we'd start about now, choosing what we wanted for Christmas. We'd start lobbying for it. Like if you wanted a really nice bicycle, you'd start working mom and dad about now. You know, if you said bicycle up there at the hardware store, that thing is beautiful. If you see the wheels on that thing, man, it's got them handlebars and that basket on the front, we'd start working them. So when, you know, my father went to work, he'd have to start thinking about, how am I going to get the money to buy that? Four boys. You know, my father brother, he, you know, he wanted a surfboard when he was young. He lived there. He, he didn't want any surfboard. He wanted a really good one, you know. So I'm sure Daddy would wake up in the morning, God, man, these four boys cost me an arm and a leg. But we'd start working, you know, because... Usually we got one big thing for Christmas. And we didn't go for two, because you go for two, you may not get anything. You know, you put all your eggs in one basket, and you go, that's what you go for. The Apostle Paul wanted something for Christmas. He wanted, all he wanted, not complicated, all he wanted was to know and participate in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, just give me the power of resurrection. And that's it. That's all I want. You know, today, from 2 to 4 and 6 to 8, tomorrow morning at 11, we're going to be celebrating <coughs> the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be celebrating because Sidney Whip's going to be in it. He is going to be one of the newest members in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ forever. Now he's done a whole lot of things. And you know, he worked with a challenger team with the kids that were challenged. And, you know, he worked around here and raised kids and everything he did. But nothing paid for it. Nothing paid for it. His faith in Jesus Christ. God is good. God is good. We will celebrate the fact that Sydney knows that now. When he gets there, he says, hey, Paul, this is cool, man. This is really, look at this. Look at this. We are celebrating in heaven the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's where the rubber hits the road. That's when the bell rings. That's the prize. Paul says, that's my prize. That's my prize. I challenge you to think of anything more important for you. I challenge you to think of anything bigger than knowing. At the right time, the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is coming to you. Put your name on that contract. Put your name on that contract. When you face death, that's what you get. Wow. Wow. You know, you follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. It's a long road sometimes. Sometimes it's a lot of trouble. Sometimes it requires big commitment. But look at the prize. Look at the prize. I want to know Jesus. That's all I want. For what? That's all I want. So, our Father God, we we're thankful for your, your servant, Paul, who gave his great life. We're thankful that he came to know the power of the resurrection of your son, Jesus. We're thankful that Sydney now knows the power of the resurrection of your son, Jesus. We pray that it waits for each of us. We know that we shall not leave this earth without him. Be with us that we may know that power, too. We pray through his Holy Spirit. Amen. The Christian church is authorized by Jesus Christ to, to make this offer. If led by the Spirit, we invite you to become part of our church family, either by a transfer of membership or by your confession of faith in Jesus Christ and baptism. We invite you to come to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the commitment of your faith. As we offer this invitation and these moments of celebration, shall we turn to our invitation hymn? I have decided to follow Jesus. Nobody else that I've ever met has ever wanted to take that back. You know, sometimes you make a decision and you get buyer's remorse. I've never known anybody that had buyer's remorse on Jesus. If you want to make that decision, you're invited to come forward and be received. Shall we stand together? <coughs> Still dangerous in this world. Shalom.